Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I'm excited to have you guys here, as always. And I'm excited that my friend Chris brought the people in today. I'm super excited. And today we're really going to dig into something that, that I feel is worthy of a conversation. And sometimes I think Chris, get, maybe he has a, sometimes has a bad rap of being somebody who really likes to push, you know, and, um, uh, but really he's just such a softy and he's just really passionate about people. Sorry, Chris, I think. And I did teach him something that, technical today about Zoom, didn't I? Yes, you did. You schooled me. <laughs> That never happens, people. We're writing it down. I have that <laughs> in record. Okay, so, January, I schooled Chris today. <laughs> so, t so it is episode three hundred and thirteen. Wow, it's a it's a rough uh, day. It's nine eleven, so oh, yes. another thirteen and everything. So anyway, we're gonna dig into about what makes somebody an expert, and who better to talk about it than the expert Chris Doe? <laughs> so we have we have I'm in Chris's pro group called the the future pro group. I don't know. It doesn't have an E on the end because they're really bad spellers. No, mm. I'm just kidding. Um so and he really talks to us about um a lot of really great things that have really helped me with my business or even my mindset, to be honest. And and then just being friends with him has helped that as well. But he talks to us about reading books and one of the things me and him are a bunch of people and me and him, right? You with other people. I just feel like you're talking to me when you're in those groups, but you're not, I know. Anyway, you talked about your son and it was your oldest son. Wow. He, he, wow. Right. How he was learning how to, re or they were teaching him how to read, not read like first grade books, but like really dig in and get the content. Mm -hmm. And that was something that really stuck out to you as you're like, whoa, how are you reading this? Can you kind of describe to them what they were doing? Yes. Uh, my son, my oldest son, his name is Otto, and he's 15 years old now. He's had the privilege, and this is what we worked for as parents, to be able to provide our children with the very best in education. I am a product of public school education, mostly in California, right? And the education that I got is very different. That was about memorization, repetition, and being tested. He's gone to the Montessori school system. He's gone to school for gifted children. And so when I see the kinds of ways they teach and how they learn, it's vastly different. And I'm in awe in what he's able to do at this ripe old age of 15. When I looked at his book, I, I flipped it open. It's full of notes and stickies and underlining and highlighting and questions he's asking. And there's different methods like the Harkness method, which they learn, and it's very discussion based. This is very different than memorization. It then kind of spawned me to, or inspired me to start thinking about how do I know what I know? Now, there are a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, who look up to me and say, because you're an expert at this, fill in the blank. And I never thought of myself as an expert at anything. I'm just like you, I'm just trying to do, I'm just trying to be better than I was yesterday. But if people are ready to put that label on you to say you're an expert at something, how did I get here and why did they think that? And I can boil it down to three things. The experience I've had, yes, I've been in business for 20 years. That gives you plenty of opportunity to screw up. I've been coached for 10 of those years. And I, in the last, I would say five and a half, 10 years, I've been making it more of an intentional habit to read. And so if I can't, um, speed up your process of learning in terms of, well, you want to be better today. I can't tell you to wait 20 years. That's not helpful to anybody. And if you can't afford to hire a business coach and work with them for 10 years, cause you can't, you don't have the money or the time. The last variable is to read. And I'm looking at it. This is not a zero sum game. If you can make incremental improvement consistently over time, you'll be shocked at the results that you can get. So my recommendation to the group was, Read five books, not just any five books, but read five books on one topic so that you can gain some level of understanding of that topic. Then it turns out after researching this and looking into the book, How to Read, the fourth and deepest way to understand how to read is synoptical reading. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But it's not about you trying to understand what one author says, but what the subject says. So this is where you compare and contrast and you make notes say on an issue of pricing or negotiations or marketing, and you're getting a plurality of voices and opinion that you get to wrestle in your mind and, and resolve like what you believe to be true. 
And so I inadvertently had encouraged the pro members to do the synoptical style of reading. That's what I want. So on their path towards achieving mastery or expertise, they're going to learn so much through reading and through sharing and through teaching that that would then position them to be somebody to be sought after, to be paid more money, and to be also more helpful to their clients that they're working with today. It also helped us to have to decide on one thing because you you actually had us focus on one thing. Like, what do you think? And I remember what I wrote down, <laughs> which anyway, I'll tell you what it was in a second. But you were like, what is the one thing that you think you are put on this earth to do? And I said, I think we should be nice. I think people should be nicer to each other. And um, pretty much that was the sum of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Just uh, share some love, I think, and help each other. And and it was funny because I was like, wow, that wasn't the books. But so it made me investigate different books because that wasn't, you know, that wasn't maybe businessy, but I think that that's okay. I think that then if that's really what I felt like that was what I should do, then I started digging into some different kinds of books. And I, th- I thought that was a really good prompt for me to think about. And, and what books did you come up with and what topics did you then research about? If your philosophy, your purpose and your fundamental belief, your value is to, to, to your, your view is the world is better together and happiness is the glue that brings us together. What was the topic or the idea that you wanted to go deeper into? So I started um, looking into books that were mindset and then mm-hmm. coaching, but coaches, like how they make a team. Maybe that wasn't the, uh, we weren't talking about me, Chris. We're talking about you. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I was trying to go through my Audible and see what what books. So The Big Leap, I I read by Gay Hendricks. Have you ever read that book? No. Anyway, it's a good one. Um, the Creative Habit, it was okay. Mm. Um, and then I bought a bunch, but I haven't. Mm-hmm. Like one is Herding Tigers. I like Todd Henry. I don't know if you've ever met him. Have you no. ever met him? No. Have, do you know who he is? No. Anyway, he does this podcast called The Accidental Creative, I think. And um, he, I think that's what it is. Anyway, he's written a bunch of books that are really good. He's a writer, but he also really does businessy things for creatives, but like writers and designers. Mm -hmm. One is like um, something about dying, like leave it on the table, do it now. Don't, you know, like don't regret it when you're in the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, there were some others. uh, Idiot brain, um, ego is the enemy. Yeah. So I got some ones that hopefully, um, originals how i can't read the rest of that one but it's by adam grant anyway it just wasn't about me we gotta get i so, thought it would be helpful for you to read books on community building that's true and on positive psychology and maybe then get into things like atomic habits or uh, whatever those other subjects are that the pain points in which your community feels because i think the happiness is the byproduct of, of living a life that's aligned with your purpose and your values. And if you can make money at it, then then you're really happy. And so then you kind of look at those three overlapping circles in the Venn diagram. And if you studied each one of those, maybe you read a book or two on each and then form the synthesis of that because that's really what you're trying to do. And you're amazing at doing that, Diane. That's your natural gift. And that's why there are 40 people on this call with you today because you're that glue that brings people together. And we now just need to arm them with tools. It's not a circle of like, chanting and saying kumbaya praise the lord it's like what are we going to do with our lives because we need to take action but it's not about you right Right. (laughs) (laughs) but it's it's not but i do think uh, i i just think there was something else that otto had done um and it was this was he read when he was still living with y'all before he went off to um boarding school yes this so how old was he 13 when he did that book thing no, he's been doing it for actually a really long time. So I, I don't really know. It just, it manifests itself when, 
I, I think one day, you know, as moms do, she was cleaning out his room and then she would share some stuff with me. He's like, did you look in his drawer? I'm like, no, I try to stay out of a person's drawer. I don't really know what's in there. I don't want to discover something. But in the way he takes notes, in the way that he, he's just a studious person. And seeing him do that just blew me away. And I shared it a couple of years ago. So I know it's probably 12-ish, 12 to 13, he started doing this. So then we tell him about, so, all right, I'm going to get to the point. Okay. So there is, um, there, my friend Tony, who teaches ceramics, he had read the study and there was about, he was, there was a, a ceramicist had given two classes. It was the same level of class, but they were just at two different times or something like that. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but you get the idea. So he said to one class at the end of the semester, I want you to have one perfect bowl. Have you heard this? Yeah, it's the art of fear, right? Or Maybe so. Art. Yeah, I think it's something. Art of fear. So anyway, for anybody who doesn't know, and that was the goal of this one class. The next, the other class was to make as many bowls. It was quantity. Make as many bowls as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was the class that was just perfecting, they would make less and they would just try to perfect. But at the end of the semester or at the end of the time, the people who made more bowls had better bowls. They were more creative. It was structurally more sound because they had more practice. And so I feel like um, this kind of leads into another auto. Maybe Otto should have been on here. I'm just kidding. I'm just glad to have you on here. <laughs> I'm standing in for him. Yeah, you're standing in. But you had told me something that he had done. And it was like in his one year, they said you had to do, it was kind of like the 10,000 hour challenge, I guess. I don't care, remember what the challenge was. Mm. But I remember what he chose. He had to do something that he had never, you had to teach yourself something. And he chose the violin, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a really hard, I mean, other kids might have chose like, I don't know, Spanish or something, right? Can you yeah. tell them about that story? Sure, sure. Um, it, it, it's come, it, there's a price to this because he, he recently called and said he's stressing out over school. He's a sophomore in high school now. So here's my boy. He's not, I mean, he's studying English literature and he's studying Latin and he's also taking Mandarin, studying that to read and write in Mandarin. And then he plays the piano and he's doing double sessions now. And he decided also to add violin to it. So I don't know where he gets his kind of overworking attitude from. This is you don't programs his life. It must be from Jesse because I don't know why he would do that. And I was like, what are you doing, kid? Take a break. You're like, this is your childhood. It's okay. And he had to talk to his counselor and, and you know, talk himself off the ledge a little bit. So he let go of Latin. And I think he was sad. It's such a hard language to learn and to practice. Uh, but then he thought it was more productive for him to learn Mandarin. And he would have plenty of opportunities to use that. That's cool. But, he, but at the end of that first year of violin, he did that for a year though, didn't he? Or he didn't? Yes. He's yeah. still doing it. But he had to do it for a year. So he, and this was self-investigated study. And at the end of the year, that was what they were presenting was how far they had learned. And I think that that was such a, I think that was such a valuable lesson because as we graduate or if you finish school, you still keep learning. It's not something that, that you end. It just is the beginning, right? Yeah, it is. It's a lifelong pursuit. I can't imagine my life if I woke up one day and said to myself, learning is done. I'm done learning because then you're just busy dying, I think, because we as human beings need to grow in, in one way or the other. I'm not talking about in the midsection because everybody can do that, but we need to grow. We need to expand our mind. We need to experience new foods, flavors, cultures, languages, people. We desire growth. So to say that I'm done because I've got a degree, that would be wasting the degree. I think. But I think it's naive, but I also think they just don't realize. And you know, there's all those books that say, oh, everything I didn't learn in school. And those kind of hurt a little bit. But I feel like, hey, I taught you how to walk. Like, hey, I get nothing for the walking. Okay. But that's sort of what it feels like because they forget like, oh, it was really hard to walk in the beginning. But did you know that beavers never stop growing? Really? Yes. That's why I think designers are like beavers. But like our <laughs> brains are growing. Pardon? Is that your spirit animal? It is my spirit animal. Have I ever showed you my little beaver here? <laughs> my friend Carly made it. She's probably in here. That's yeah, really cool. she is. Isn't he cute? Yeah, Look at his little hiney. Anyway, um, I drew it and then she made that out of clay because she's mm. amazing. Anyway, that's my fight theme, be the beaver. 
Okay. So we're going to get on to number two since the first one was all about auto. So, okay. Well, so after you have read these books, you're compiling, you started sharing, um, you, well, I'm skipping around, but you started sharing these things on Instagram, doing the carousels. I know maybe you weren't the first, um, but you're stepping in there and showing them how it's done. So one of the things you seem, um, I'm just going to really quickly share my screen because I'm going to show, um, I want to show the difference because again, a lot of what you're doing is creating content. Um, you're able to to read and learn and then kind of give us the cliff notes version in Instagram. And you're really encouraging a lot of other people to do this. This is the future. The future is here without an E um, for anybody who wants to follow. But if you look between yours and these, they're not the same. I'm sure some of them maybe, um, but no, they're not the same at all. It's so they're, by a different person. Okay. They're always different. But then are you, is this, are you making some of these ones? I'm making zero of them. The okay. future Instagram account is managed by a, a woman. Her name is Elle and she interned for us now. She works for us. She works remotely. And her job is basically to scrape all the things that we're doing on all our different platforms and figure out a way to grow the, the audience. And for a long time, she, she, cause this was her job. She left me in the dust and I just felt like, gosh, how is it that she's scraping a lot of the things that I'm saying, yet she's building a bigger audience than me? That was step one. That did not sit well with me. I know it's an ego thing and here we are. It's kind of like, gosh, how is it that somebody who's doing me better than me? What the heck? And it just so coincided with having Michael Janda come on our show. He wrote the book, Burn Your Portfolio and uh, Design Psycho Psychology or Pricing Design Psychology or something like that. And then in researching him for the episode, I looked at his Instagram account and he went from like nothing to like 30,000 followers. And I looked at it quickly. And I saw carousels. Now carousels have existed for some time, but I'm not sure when they allowed you to post up to 10. And that was a game changer because I struggled with telling a story in one frame. Mm -hmm. My mission is to teach. So be, just posting one frame was just like, I can only inspire you. I can only point you in a direction, but I can't really tell the story. I'm really not that patient. So when I had him on the show, I said, you're doing great things. We had a chat afterwards. I said, dude, I'm going to do the carousel thing too. He goes, do it, man. And I went back and I told the team, I told Ben and Matthew, who are the directors at our team and Greg, guys, we got to get on this carousel thing. It's a great way to teach. Tell L, tell everybody, make carousels. And then nothing happened. And I waited. And I waited. And I was thinking, what is everybody doing? Fine. I'm going to start making carousels. It just turns out I have over 150 decks that I've designed. Not all of them are, this, are, are, the, are different and unique. But over the last, I would say, four or five years since I started teaching in this way, I have many, many decks. So I thought, easy thing. Just go back to your old decks. Instead of trying to distill hundreds of slides, just concentrate on teaching one lesson at a time. As soon as I started to do this, I started to get some traction. Now, what you're seeing right now is a goal sprint that we all set about a week ago, literally a week ago today. We had said, everybody focus on one goal that you want to have for the next two weeks and do all that you can to hit it. My goal, as, as crazy as it sounds, was to grow 10,000 new followers in two weeks. Now, to put it in perspective, it took me over two years to get to 5,000. So now I'm going to double that in two weeks. And that's nuts. And why did I come up with that number? Because I wanted to hit 200,000 followers by the end of the year. And there's only so many days left. Right. And I was thinking at this point, I was posting sporadically about once every two days, three days, if that even, much less if I'm traveling. How am I going to do two a day? That meant that I need to, to really re, re um, kind of figure out and optimize how I'm going to post things. I had to reevaluate what it is I'm doing, what is it I'm trying to say. Now I'm up to three posts a day, and I'm thrilled to say this to you and the, and the rest of the group, that I'm, I'm, go I'm gonna hit my 10,000 followers in one week and not two weeks. <gasps> That's that awesome. Crazy? Yes. Not so. But and you've I'm done. Experimenting. Right. But there's something, so there's some things that I think people it will help people. So holy moly. I mean, that's amazing, but you have some things that are in your decks that are, 
you don't have to make all these decisions all the time, right? You're, you have a tight face or a family of type. I have a template I use. Right? Yes. And I think sometimes that's really important because we get lost in these decisions. And so the content gets taken away because we're too, too busy pushing pixels around, right? Yes. So when you, um, oh, Bob says on same goal for his yeah, YouTube. I saw that. That's awesome. One week early. That's amazing, Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob and I are like, whoop, high five. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But I wanted to kind of take people through. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's a lot of typography. Sometimes there's illustration with photos. Which one of these do you want me to plop through? Me? Yes. Which one of these? I would tr probably start with the blue one. Scroll down and find the one that uh, tips for graph. There it is. A this guide one? to okay. graphic design for beginners. This one's great. No, okay. I want to share some things about this, but go ahead and ask. Okay. So, so you started this a while ago. You have yeah. adjusted, and that's the other thing. You have a template, but you're still pushing how things are. So yes. can you talk a little bit about why um, mm -hmm. that that's important? Yeah. Do you so, want me to take off screen share, or do you want to talk? No, you, no, I can just talk, and then you can do whatever. That's fine. Okay. So I, I want to let everybody know, it's I have a template, and I've been using Keynote now for some time, and the template changes. And when I say template, it's not a store-bought one. I just made it. And when you make enough slides, you start to learn like what kind of slides you need, how many temp master templates that you need uh, before it gets insane. Because when I started, I had like 50 master pages, and like that's ridiculous. I just scrolling around looking for the right template. And then you learn how to do this. So can I just explain a little bit about the layout? So anybody that wants to make a presentation deck or to make a template for themselves to post on social media, why do you see people having like the little mouse detail type on the top and the bottom or the sides? The reason being is sometimes you just have a big bold image. And this is a law of contrast. When you have a big image and you have a little bit of type, it adds a detail. It feels like it's really refined. This mm -hmm. works with interior design. It works with architecture. It works with everything. Minimal design needs the attention to detail. So nobody's meant to read that. That's just there as what we call mouse type. Now, I'm making this post and I'm thinking, I have to post two times a day. I have to move faster. And this seems like really like fundamental, kind of really super basic advice to tell people that aren't designers how to design. And I was thinking of an audience member in mind. There are many people inside the pro group who are not designers. Some people are doctors. Some people study psychology and philosophy. And I saw their carousels and they look like butt. <laughs> so I imagine them like you, you design fool, you design noob. If you don't know what you're doing, just please watch this or read this and then it will make your designs better. So I just started thinking about that. And I did this and I was like, gosh, it just feels so basic. And I'm a little embarrassed to post it. So I waited to the end of the day, like 9, 10 o'clock, which you're not supposed to post that late. And I post it. And then it's gone nuts. So it's like now it's like one of my top performing posts in the last 30 days. And why is that? And what, what, what does all of this mean? A couple of things I want to share with your audience here. One is you don't design for you. You design for your audience. If you have a clear image in your head and you're going to pretend like you're speaking to somebody, it makes writing the content much much easier do not try to say too much in your carousel because that's the other mistake that people make right just give them one step at a time because you have to think what's the rate in which somebody's swiping through my carousel if it's too long they stop they move on they will never get to carousel number 10 mm -hmm. that's something that's really important okay if you stick to some basic rules into your template and you systematize and optimize your workflow you can start to crank out content so that the design of it doesn't get in your way. It's the message, which at the end of the day is the only thing people care about. Also, through iterating and forcing myself to stick to a schedule, I found that the posts were getting better and I was moving faster. So initially, in the one week, one week ago, I was thinking there's no way I can make two posts a day. And truthfully, I did not start with two posts a day. I made one post a day thinking that's pretty fast. And then I got to a post and a half. And now I have like four posts and I, I just don't want to kill people with too many posts. So I slow down. I'll release them a little bit more periodically. But the really cool thing is with anything, if you do it so many times, you just get better and you say, what if I try this? What if I try that? So you'll see that now instead of just designing single slides, I'm designing for the platform. So some graphics carry over from one page to the other. So I'm thinking super horizontal format. Not all, not all of them line up, but I'm, I'm playing around with those ideas and themes. 
And at first it seemed like I was really boxed in with all these rigid parameters, but those parameters have really opened up my mind as to what else I can do. Let me give you a practical application of this. If you force yourself to use primarily two typefaces, you think, well, I'm stuck. I want to use five different typefaces. What happens is if you use two, you get really inventive. Like what else can I do? Mm-hmm. What if I flip it over? What if I change the color? What if I add a gradient on top? What if I make it so big the type cuts off the entire screen? So these are the fun things. That you, like what if I rotate the type? Mm-hmm. So I'm principally using two typefaces, Helvetica Now from Monotype and Champion Gothic, which I also believe is from Monotype. Those are my primary two typefaces. On occasion, I break it to, to meet a brand. Like if I'm going to talk about something, I want to be consistent with that brand. But other than that, those are only my two typefaces. And people keep asking me, it almost guaranteed every carousel, somebody's like, yo, what typeface is that? Champion and Helvetica now. That's it. So when you work with really basic tools and you force yourself to get creative with the tools you have versus wishing for things that you don't have, that's where it gets really interesting. Here's a really cool part. People are excited about these slides. They're asking, did I miss the video? Where did it get this from? So here's another benefit. By breaking down my thinking into 10 slide carousels. It takes the fear of making one great big thing to to, to tie it into your art of fear. And it allows me to see what people like, what they don't like. And they, they help me. They, they correct things. They're like, you know, you should think about this person or here's a quote, or here's an idea you should look into. And by the way, you misspelled that thing. I'm like, okay, thank you. So I get to enlist and roll my entire followers to being unpaid proofreaders for me. How fantastic is that? And they're also my test group. So I get to try ideas and see if it works. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the most popular carousels, string them together. I'm going to do a video presentation. I'm going to record it. The team can cut it up. So it's pre-vetted content. So at least now we know what works. So this is kind of a very different approach than than the one Matthew took earlier today, but both styles work. Matthew's slow, methodical, deliberate. I'm like, let's try this. Let's fail many times. And I'm a big believer in this. Seth Godin, whoever fails the most wins. And the only way you get to fail the most is you don't make one giant gamble and it sinks your entire company or it kills you. Imagine if it took me three weeks to make one post and nobody cared. That would hurt me emotionally. It's like, God, the world just doesn't care. I'm a bad artist. I have nothing to contribute to the world. But instead, I get to try. I get to learn. And it's a conversation with the audience. When they ask a question in the comments, that becomes my next post. Hmm. So it's generative. Those are all the benefits. So if we are talking about this as an expert, from that expert phase. So I have this project that I do with my students. The seniors do this project. And it's called a Teach Me. And it, it elicits many tears because they're, I say, oh, you're going to share something. It's nine minutes you share and you have to, it's something that you're an expert at. And so they're like, I'm not an expert at anything. And I'm like, can you tie your shoes? And they were like, yes. I'm like, you are an expert. And so it takes them out of like, just thinking about it as a design solution. So I think that, you know, a lot of people, there are lots of influencers out there and lots of brands are trying to be influencers. And maybe there's something we were talking about this in a Bible study at the end of Bible study the other day, um, we were talking about how maybe we um, we really could be content provider, content creators for our clients. Maybe that's a whole nother avenue that maybe some of us could be going down that we're not going down. But we yes. really kind of have to figure out how who their audience is and how to how to start testing and iterating for them. Mm-hmm. Um, And they have to be able to either give you content or you have to be so close and be part of the team that you can create content for them that resonates as them, as their heartbeat, you know, of, of their brand. Yes. So, um, did you want to say something? Sorry. I didn't mean to. No, no, I'm just agreeing. I could say anything anytime. So keep talking. (laughs) Okay. So, so there's two ways. One, you can do this for yourself. And one, you can also think about how you could do this for your brand. So if you, if you were taking this or for a company's brand, not your brand. So right. if you were going to do this commercially, and this was something that anybody here could do, and how would you think you would go about um, selling an I- idea like this to a client? Mm, perfect. I, I want to say this. So when you work on this for yourself, not only do you grow your own following, you grow emotionally, spiritually, energy, a design. You, you learn how to communicate. And this is a valuable skill. You learn the ability, 
how the, you, you, you develop the ability to articulate yourself in very bite-sized pieces. And this is fantastic. All of a sudden, your, your audience is growing. People are paying attention. And I recently uh, uh, got a, a deal where a brand wanted to pay me, I, I know it's not a ton of money, but $1,500 to post because I'm an influencer now. Hey, so way to go. Yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. And another person came out of the woodwork and said, hey, we would like for you to use this and tell us what you think. We'll pay you $2,500. So the rate's getting up there. I know it's not Kim Kardashian money, but it's money. It's pretty cool. Hey, that's a whole pro group membership for a year, $1,500. Yeah, so, you know, this is this is pretty cool. So you get rewarded along the way, and there's just so much upside and so little downside potential. Why everybody isn't doing it, I don't know. But here's the cool thing. Companies might be checking you out right now thinking, wow, that content is fire. Oh, gold. It's amazing. Diamonds, nothing but diamonds. And then eventually they may say, hey, can you help us do this? Because our social feed sucks. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert, but if you like what I'm doing, I can replicate that formula for you. And then you now have a potential client on an ongoing basis. And there's a real reason why a lot of companies need this right now. The old form of marketing is to just talk at people on old channels, radio, TV, billboards, print. And now we have to have a conversation with people. And a lot of the companies and brands do not know how to do this. They don't know it conceptually. It's so foreign to them. So if you have young people watching this, I would say this is your language. You grew up with the internet and you know how to talk to people on this kind of platform. This is fantastic. So this is a highly desirable skill. I'm actually being approached by large marketing firms to say, can you teach us to do this marketing thing? What? I don't know anything about marketing. <laughs> like, no, you do because look at what you're doing. That's what we need to do. Proof. It's proof. And, I, and my thing is, as always, I don't know. If you want me to tell you how I did what I did, I'm happy to, but I'm not claiming to be an expert at anything. They're like, no, you are. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So let's do this. So there are many benefits. You could do this in-house or you could do what some people have done, which is to create communities around Instagram for business. There's somebody out there that's very successful. that's over 4,000 members is a Facebook group. And I think they charge like $30 a member. I don't know the math on that, but it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money because there's a demand for this. How do we use Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what are the other ones? LinkedIn to transition from traditional advertising to more of a social media conversation, content marketing world. That's, that's, the, that's a very valuable skill. And that's what I'm learning right now. So with what you're reading currently, is that, is those, is that how you determine what you're reading? And, I, you know, obviously you have five books and it ebbs and flows. It changes. It's kind of just like you're doing this post. You're not saying that you're staking your claim in this and you're only going to do this. It's kind of like you've said this about hobbies before. You mm -hmm. got into fly fishing or you got into whatever and you go all in, diving in deep in. You're not just wading in. You get all the equipment. You're going in. And I think that in a way that's made you really good at trying new things. But then you also are able to decide, nope, I don't want to do this anymore. So yes. there's it's the same thing with reading and, and the experience of learning and then making these um, bite-sized, um, in you know, you can process it. A audience member could process it, yes. right? Yes. So I, I want to expand on that because there's some side conversations that Diana are having that you may not be privy to as an audience. I, I, I love just going deep and losing myself and whatever, whatever it is that I'm into. So I'm an all in or all out kind of person. So you want me in? I'm all in. I'm super hot. I'm burning passion. I'm reading magazines and books and experiencing buying all kinds of junk. And then when I'm done, I'm done. Unfortunately, there's like the artifacts of my passion, which is lots of junk around the house. My wife's like, I want to get rid of that. I'm like, can we just leave it there? Maybe I'll revisit it. <laughs> I, I need to do I get, I need to get therapy on that. But okay, so this is what I'm doing. So I feel like there are lots of gaps in my knowledge. And so I pick a topic. Like I wanted to know more about positioning and marketing. We do it. We have a theory about it. But it, it would be good if we talk to or learn from people whose entire professional life has been focused on learning about marketing or writing about positioning. 
So that was my focus. And you can't see this, but I have a whole bunch of books over there and a bunch of books on the floor, some on my desk even, on these topics. And I just go in. So I was, for, for a while there, I was reading a book a day, just crushing it, making notes, doing the syntopical reading and just writing notes. And that's what I'm doing. Now I've stopped deliberately because I realized in the last month, I've probably read six or seven books. Reading is just the first part. Understanding and applying is the hard part. So I have to stop because I need to create a sp some space for myself to apply. Okay, wait, where am I going to apply all this knowledge? Nobody's hiring me to do a marketing campaign right now. Oh, you know, there's this audience on the internet. Maybe they would also like to come along with me for the ride. So what I do is I try to share as much of what I'm learning as quickly as I can because somebody out there needs to hear that at that one moment in time. One of the most common comments that I get is, I needed this today. And at first I used to laugh and I roll at that, like whatever. What do you mean you need it today? Like, how is it? And some people would say, are you reading my mind? So here's the thing. When you put out good stuff into the world, somebody out there will pick it up and say, you know what? Thank you for doing that for me. I had a tough moment with my client today or I was stuck on a problem and you helped me. A post is coming out about this. So this is not all wasted content. So I'm going to talk about this, about reciprocity, right? Mm. You give and just the nature of human being, human psychology is we're not okay with just taking. People tend, when you give them something, they tend to give something back. So what are they giving me back right now? Right now, they're giving me their time and attention, which I think is very valuable. They're also giving me likes, comments, and shares, and they're trying to help me with my mission of teaching a billion people. Well, that's something that's valuable to me. So there's an exchange, and I love it. And it's virtuous versus um, vicious, right? I give, they gain, they grow, they give back, I gain. So we just keep building each other up. And I, I see on the daily now, messages from people. I used to charge $500. Now I'm charging 20,000. I used to charge 5,000. Now I'm charging 60,000. Ooh, that makes me like one proud father. For sure. Cause you've changed people's lives. It's not that you've, and what I, what I love, I think that, um, you know, some people may have said, Oh, you know, what makes someone an expert? She's having Chris Doe on. Let's see what he says. You know, he's an expert or he thinks he's an expert, but actually you wouldn't say, I don't think you would say that. And because you're really clear about saying, Hey, I'm learning. Let me just take you on this journey. So really this is something that we can use in our lives, what we're learning, because you never know who's behind you. Yes. Right. If we focus on that, we are never, I, I've talked about this before is this, um, the mean Diane and you and I have had conversations on the side about this when I've been on the struggle bus and you, you said to me, Diane, um, wow, you have really high expectations of yourself and I do, but it was way too hard for me trying to ride a bike the first time and not fall over. You know, it was, that was what I was expecting. I had seen right. other people. And I think it's funny when a kid does something in a class and they were like, well, I watched YouTubes on it. And I was like, but have you, have you played around with that concrete? You know, and have you, you know, have you tried to do that? And they were like, well, I watched a bunch of YouTubes. I'm like, Hmm. Oh, okay. And so that's what I think. I think you are saying about the book and the reading, whatever people are doing, there's a time to consume and, 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 ingest but then there's a time that you have to process you have to process that information instead of just continually consuming there is the the waves come in and then the waves go out and i think that there's there's um there's a process to it and then you have to execute and you have to do something and then you try again and i think that you doing this on a quick speed is helping you to grow quicker not just followers, but also mentally, because you're able to say, but I think if you weren't talking to people, I think if you were doing this in a vacuum, Chris, it wouldn't be as uh, impactful, not about people, but it's that you're hearing what other people it are. It is these conversations. So it's, this is something that these people who are dog walkers or whatever, they can be the, they can t share what they're doing and how, what they've done to help you know, ease the whatever of the dogs as they're on a walk and somebody else may need to hear it. There may be plenty of people are like, who is she to think she knows how to do dog walking, but you're further along than somebody else. 
right? Yes, you're always further along than somebody else. And how many times have we sat around and thought to ourselves, I wish somebody were going through this pain with me right now who had one new answer for me. And of course, that happens all the time. So what you do is when you don't share, you're actually robbing somebody else's ability to grow and to learn. And I know some people think like this, the school of hard knocks, which is like, I did it the hard way. We didn't have any of these advantages and you shouldn't either. And I think that's one cranky way of doing things. Or it could just be, you know what? I suffered through 20 years of pain. If I can save you two years of that, my goodness, I'm going to try my best to do that. And if it doesn't work for you, that's okay. Because I also had this worldview, like you just got to do what works for you. All I can do is provide you the information that I believe to be true to me at this moment in time. And then you get to decide, do I want to try this or don't I want to try it? And that's it. Now, I do want to say this thing to you, Diane, which I think you're such a generous, warm, gracious person to everyone. Except for yourself. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Except for I yourself. Did. Because like, you're like, I want to try this thing. But it's like your bicycle analogy, I would just one-up that, okay? It's like you barely learn how to ride a bicycle, but you're like, you know what? I'm going to get on a unicycle and I'm <laughs> going to juggle flaming swords while uh, posting on Instagram with one hand. And if I don't do that, I'm a total failure. Mm. And I think what we need to do is use a slightly different lens. Instead of looking at the person we want to become because it seems so far away, it seems so distant, is look at the person we are today. This is what it means to be present and say like, boy, that's a little bit better than I was yesterday. And I'm actually really enjoying this process. I think I read this quote from Wayne Dwyer, Dyer and he said something like, you know, dancing isn't about making sure you get to a position on the floor. It's about enjoying every step along the way. So, so Dan, in all of this, guys, and I really believe this, if you could be 2%, just 2% better today than you were yesterday, compounded over the lifetime of your professional career, you will become a master. It's just the 2% is what people are not, not willing to settle for because they're so hard on themselves. You know, I'm going to bring this back to the beaver. Let's do it. We so a beaver... A beaver you know, they get their dams broken. It could be a natural disaster, but they don't just fall apart. You know, they, um, they just are like, okay, I, hey, I hear some water running. Let's go stop that up, right? And I just feel like I do. I know what you're saying. And I am trying. I'm really working on being nicer to me. But I, um, but I really do think that sometimes people just need somebody to believe in them. And that's what, to me, you and Dustin have really done that for me. And it's like, you can do this. And it's like, wow, thank you for seeing something. And you just have no idea, no matter who it is, Brittany Barnhart's in here. She may have somebody who's following her that really needs to, you know, when you comment on somebody else's post and you're like, wow, that is awesome. Or that it really just is like, oh man, maybe I'm on the right track or maybe it, you have no idea how this tiny a bit of time that if you just invest in some other people even if it's just 15 minutes a day that you just spread some goodness you could just really change somebody else's output and i i do think like i just think that if we just did that that would be if we all committed to doing that for 15 minutes a day of just sharing love i think that would be a great people would feel connected because they would feel heard and they would feel, I mean, and like, again, just like what you're sharing, you're sharing these things that maybe seem so basic to you. This is why I like teaching. You've asked me this before, like what keeps you in the classroom? And I think, you know, I'm like, sometimes I'm frustrated because I want them to know this already. Like, don't you know, why would you do this? Like when people hand me my change wrong at the drive through or something, you know, like, you hand the coins first and then the money so that I can hold on to the coins while I grab the dollar bills, you know, like that's the proper way. Everybody, I know I've talked about this before. So anyway, I'm on a rant, but I really do feel like you've got to be, we have to think, well, we know this, but somebody else doesn't even like you are so even embarrassed to post that the basics and that really helped so many people. So even the basics is what we need to post. That's why I even said about tying your shoes. I don't know. You guys are, um, I tie my shoes backwards. Like if you ever see me in person tying my shoes, Chris, you're going to be like, yeah, 
So I think what I did is I did it how my dad did it. Well, I did it how he was doing it to me. So I did it the same way I saw him doing it. He wasn't next to me doing it. He was in front of me doing it. So I mirrored it. And that's how I tie. It's actually the proper way to tie shoes. There is a proper way and an improper way. Like one falls out earlier or easier or whatever. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Oh, we're like on number two still. Uh, just so you know. Do you have any <laughs> something real quick though? Yes, of course. Um, you want to spread this goodness to the world and some people are thinking, I just don't know what that would be. Mm. And I think that's a reflection that I would suggest this, that the goodness that you need to spread, the little love, it needs to start with you first. That there's a hole here and nobody's tending to your hole and mm. not even you. You're ignoring the, the void that exists within you. So start there, all right? Tell yourself some things that you like about your life, the way that you look and the, the progress that you're making. And then now you have all this fuel, this energy, this positivity that radiates from you. It's much more genuine to share with people. So start there. There's no coincidence that the air mask comes down and they tell you put it on yourself first before you help anybody. It's the same in life. Do that first. Question number three. <laughs> okay. I actually think that we still didn't get to question two. It was oh, about was question two. <laughs> when did you implement this type of reading? Like how long ago did you start reading what did you call it again? Because can you say it slower? Uh, the word, syntopical reading, S-Y-N-T-O-P-I-C-A-L. I'm just learning the word myself. So these are like the wonderful discoveries that we have in our lives that you do something and you think this is weird. And then you read about it, like professionals who've studied this call it something and they're like, wow, that's really interesting. An example is Matthew and I are having lunch. We're having shabu shabu. And he's like, Chris, are you into stoicism? I said, you know, people keep asking me that. And I know what being stoic means. I think that's how I live my life. But no, he said, you'd really love it because it's exactly how you think. And then I went home and told my wife, he said, I get this a lot. People recommend me to read books about the things that I already do and know. And here's the thing though. And, and I think I'm coming from a humble place here. I don't want to reaffirm what I already know and believe to be true. I want to learn about the things that are going to challenge the things I do not know anything about. That's where I'm going to spend my time because, look, let's face it, there's a finite amount of time in which I can learn. I mean, I could live five lifetimes to live 500 years and not be able to read all the books I want to read. So we have to kind of prioritize there. Absolutely. Yeah, syntopical reading. All right. So when did you start, when did you adopt that type of reading? You know, okay, I'll tell you, probably about 12, 14 years ago, I started teaching at Art Center and they wanted me to teach sequential design, how to make storyboards for commercials. And I taught myself that because I studied traditional graphic design. So I had to go into research mode and say, like, if I'm going to teach people something, I don't want to teach them bad things, things that are not correct and true. I need to verify what the experts think about these things. Now, in the beginning, few resources were available. But as I expanded my search and scope, I started to find all kinds of things. And I, I was reading that. I read with a different lens in mind. The lens I had to read with was, is this something I can use to help my students grow? If not, I'm going to skip over these parts. And when I found something good, I sat there and I just, I would stare at or reread it like, what are they thinking about when they wrote this? It's like, what's the idea behind it? And how did they arrive at this conclusion? So I want to reverse engineer the thinking. And so this is part of it. It's like having a dialogue with the author. And they talk about this in, in the book, How to Read, which is reading it, we know it's an active, not a passive thing that you do, but to be really active, it's like a game of baseball. The author, the writer throws you a ball and you're the catcher and you don't just receive, you receive the ball and to play the game, you have to throw it back. The throwback is a challenge. It's an argument to make sure you understand or to question the validity of the idea. And it goes back and forth. It's a game you play with yourself. So what I was doing is I was reading with the intention to teach. It made me read very differently. So later on, I found out this is kind of what it is. So then you have thoughts on my favorite way of reading, which is audible or audio reading. You think that it's better to read. So I'm a super, super, super slow reader. Me like too. Mm, I think I'm slower than that. <laughs> even slower than that. Okay, so I have to hear every word 
mm. as I'm going across. So I, I, mm. I, I don't know what that is. I know that it really sucked as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fast reader. I get tired, I think, when I'm, but when I'm listening to it, man, I, I can envision maybe what they're saying. But you're right, it's hard to take notes. It's hard to take notes and you're using that one sense of listening. And I think you can't have the argument like, what do you, how do you process this? Because when I listen to things that are really intense and filled with information, I have to re-listen to parts like five, six, seven times. I've, I've learned in my life that I'm a visual learner. I mean, most of us designers are visual learners. We learn through that and we learn through experience. So when I read a book, and, and somebody was saying this to me, it was sacrilegious. It was against their moral and ethical code to literally write inside the book. You're defacing the thing. I said, you know what? I cannot think of a higher honor for the author for you to read so intently that you're making notes in the margins and post notes and calling things out. It's not meant to be a work of art. Right. It's, it's a tool. It's something that's supposed to be used. If you have a fancy car and you leave it in the garage because you're afraid to damage it, there's a term for that. You're, you're a garage queen. You take the, the, the car out, you drive it, you experience it, you love it, you honor it by using it, not by cherishing it and putting it on a pedestal. You don't do that for things. You don't do that to people. You, you engage and you, you, you interact with the thing. That's how you get the value from it. So that's why they say people who read this way have a hard time selling their books because it's a part of who they are now. Imagine mm-hmm. that. So, so that's why I read. And that's why I think it's important for you to read like with something in front of you so that you can process, record, revisit, understand, dissect, and break it down. And here's my problem. I'm the exact opposite to Dan. When somebody says a word on the radio, I, I can't figure out how to spell it. It's hard for me to remember. But when I look it up and I see the words, the letters and the configuration, the senders and descenders, I remember the word. That's just me. Hmm. That's good. I I think I'm visual, but I think audible is or audio listening. Oral. Oral. Some, oral yeah. Aural. A U R A L. Whatever. Yeah. Um, I know how to spell it. Um, but I'm spelling think, it for all the visual people. I know. I think that um I think it had to do with something with maybe a, I don't know. I can just hear, I don't know. I think people are, a lot of people are multi, you know, they have multi learning. Mm -hmm. I like touch too. I like to do it. Um, But anyway, so I want to at least say you're, you have written a book. So you have started a conversation. You've started a game with us with Mm -hmm. this wasn't even on our thing, but so what makes you feel like you could share in a book or why did you want to share in a book? Because that's a big okay. step, right? Sure uh, Instagram oh post is a lot different than yeah. writing a book. The permanence of writing a book. It's a lot of things that why I would never want to write a book, but our audience, our, my community, and when I say things, they're like, you know, when's your book coming out? Can you put this in a book? And I was thinking, my God, I learn from books. What am I doing here? I'm making videos and, and doing podcasts. I'm robbing them of my own experience about what I think is valuable. So at the risk of totally embarrassing myself professionally and personally, I started to write the book. And I said, I don't want to write a book unless people really want it. So we ran a Kickstarter. And I thought that was going to, to save me. Like, like, see, I told you guys, you don't really want the book from me. So we set a, a goal. I think the goal was like $30,000 or something like that. We raised $87,000 to write this book. And I was like, shoot, it's one of those goals that you don't actually want to hit. It really was. And so I started writing. I'm like, that's stupid. That's dumb. And I just went over it and just like, I didn't want to write this thing. It feels like it's a commitment that's like etched in stone at this point. And I just didn't want to do that. But I got over myself. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the preface. And the preface says something like this. Like, this has been the scariest thing I've ever done in my life to lay my thoughts bare for all of you to judge me and to criticize and possibly ridicule me. But as I've always said to, to people, my advice has been, it's better to regret the things you do than the things that you don't. Mm. So who am I now? So I concluded by saying a bunch of things and then saying, to heck with regret. Mm. Just put it out there. On Instagram, if I F up, I just delete it. On Twitter, I just repost, I delete. That's the problem with print. So I think we also have an attachment, conceptual attachment to what print is. 
It's this rarefied form of knowledge captured and to be preserved. Well, screw it. I don't like it. I'm just going to burn the books. I mean, not literally, because that's bad for the environment, but I'll just destroy it. No problem. I had to start to think of it as impermanent as social media. So it was just a conceptual mental challenge. I'm now excited to possibly even entertain writing a second book. And Greg's like, don't do it. Do not do that, Chris. But yes, there you go. So I'm going to ask this question. I'll, we'll end with this one. We'll just have to do a part two um, or part eight. I don't know because I didn't get through many of the questions. Stuff, but we had a great conversation. I'm super thankful. Okay. So one of the questions was, you know, when um, there are lots of people who are um, younger or have less experience, has nothing to do necessarily with age, but maybe just that they came into this field later or they do whatever, whatever field they're in. How do they get to be, or I mean, I don't think that anybody ever becomes an expert, but really you are called an expert by other people, not right. you calling yourself an expert, yes. right? Right. So what would you tell somebody who was, all right, we're going to pick on Mario because I love Mario. He's in the pro group and he's, um, yes. he's great. And he's doing um, carousels as well. Yeah. You've inspired lots of people. Mm -hmm. So what would you say? So Mario's taking a big step. I don't know if you know, but he's going full-time dad mode and full-time designer in like four days, right? I think something. Maybe he left already. <laughs> he's like, huh catching out. Um, but anyway, so really soon he's going full time as a designer. He's quitting his job so he can take care of the kids and do design, really focus on that. What would you tell him? Because I know that there are times and a lot of people who are here are those people who are, um, they've taken that step already or they're in a full time job, but they don't feel, they will never feel like they're an expert at something. So how do they find who that audience is or that person, like how do you, how do you pick who it is that you're talking to? Do you talk to an old you, like a five year ago you? I know you really picked a person because you had a, a group of people. But what would you do? What would you tell a person uh, new to the industry or somebody who's maybe doubting themselves about writing content or just self doubt in general? Mm, let's say writing content. So they're trying to be, they want to be this expert. They want to be seen as this, but they have such maybe self-doubt. Okay. All right. The first thing is not to pursue the goal of being perceived as an expert. The first goal is just to be able to know what it is you're thinking. So an expert has labels, expectations, and attachment to it. And that's a scary thing. I, I'm pretty sure if I've said it before, it would probably be like under five times. I don't claim to be an expert at anything. I know things about things. And if you think that's an expert, then I'm glad to receive the title from you. But otherwise, I'm just pursuing growth and knowledge. And I, I'm a life learner. I'm a constant improver. And that's all I want to do. So if we look at it through that lens, like I just want to learn and just be super selfish and passionate. Like I just want to learn. And if I start there, that's a good place. And then if I find something good, like I found like an oasis somewhere, an oasis, of a pool of knowledge. And then I feel like maybe I should share this with somebody and then put that out into the world and say, look, I really, I, I really thought this idea was powerful and it might help you and tell them why. So mm -hmm. forcing you to articulate what you just learned allows you to clarify your own thinking. And you can do it in a tweet, a medium post. You could do it on Instagram or, or anywhere on your website, a blog post, just do that. I never realized before the importance of articulation. And it was not to say what you already know, but to discover what it is that you were thinking in the first place. My wife would always question me like, honey, why do you volunteer to speak at so many things and go to these groups and spend hours talking to strangers? Why are you doing that? And she could not understand what I could not articulate before. And I finally said, you know, I get way more than I give. She's like, how is that possible? See, what they do is they extract what I didn't even know I knew from me by asking me something. Like you're asking me a story about auto or expertise or content marketing. Well, that's a prompt. And a prompt allows me to respond and say, what is it that I know about this thing? And I just can share that. 
Now, I also put out on the internet, I reserve the right to change my mind at any time. And that's an important thing, to give yourself the flexibility to change your mind. I think this is growth, this is wisdom, this is experience, right? You just have to let go. Now, Tony Robbins, I said, I think he said this, he said, the single most compelling motivational driving factor in human beings is the desire to be consistent with ourselves. Hmm. And it's totally true. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. How can it be used for good? Well, if you give somebody your word that you will appear somewhere and you will do this thing or you'll do two posts a day or finish a book by a certain date, that's enough to compel you to stick to your word. That's, that's the right kind of consistency. The bad kind of consistency is to say, I've always thought this way. It will always be this way. and It will never be different to hold on to those ideas. You've seen this happen. You probably have done this yourself in that you get into an argument with somebody and you know you're wrong. You just know it. Like I get this way with my wife. I'm, I'm a bad human being. I know. I get this way. I'm like, I know she's right, but I just can't let her have this one. I'm just not going to do it. Not now, at least. I'll admit it under my breath later, but I just can't admit it. So it's that desire to be consistent because our culture, our society, our parents have told us, be consistent. You are as good as your word. Hmm. That's the problem there. So we need to flip that. We need to say, you know what? I'm an evolving human being. I make mistakes every day. And that's good because mistakes means I'm trying new things and I'm learning what works and what doesn't work. So that's it. I love that. So at least it gets our question answered about expert that you can't, nobody can really is calling themselves an expert. We're all curious. Yeah, well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. I know. That's what I mean. We shouldn't. Anyway. Yeah. Well, so when does the book come out? When can people get it? I got it on the, I did the non-signed backer. one, but yeah, I'm a backer. Okay. All right. When can you get it? So literally it went to press uh, on Monday and through like so many rounds of proofing, we still catch little things. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's, I'm sure there's still one more mistake in there that I'm just, my eyes are bleeding at this point. So it's going to press. I think we're going to get it in a month. We paid for expedited printing and shipping. And so we're waiting for our first physical proof. And that'll be the moment of truth, so to speak. When I'll thumb through it, I'll hold in my hands and everything that you've imagined in your mind to be real. And after we've fulfilled all the backers, and then we'll figure out a way to sell this thing. We haven't even gone through that part. Haven't even started thinking about that part? No, because no. it's like, you know what? Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with this. We, we, we ordered extra copies, hoping that other people would want to read it and I can share it with people. Uh, and I think it'll do okay, but you know. It will do great. I, I can't wait to read it. Because you're I never going to do an audio book, right? No, I'm just kidding. I actually have to. Oh, good. One Yay. Because like, we met our funding goals. And Greg's like, when are you going to record the audio version? Oh, shoot, I don't want to hear myself talk. This is not good. Oh, it'll be great. I'm going to be glad it's you talking to me. I, that's the thing I like. I hate when an author gets somebody else to read it. Unless it's like a fiction book and they're a really good actor, and then I love it. But yes. anyway, so <laughs> well, any any tips that you would give to somebody who's doubting? Maybe like Mario, about to pivot or have pivoted and now they're doubting. What are they doubting? Themselves. <laughs> like, can I do this? Is this like, did I make the right choice? Oh my goodness. You know, it's, a, okay, it's it. the bad Diane. <laughs> bad Diane. Let me, I need to imagine somebody see so bad Diane. Here's the thing is that I believe this is that happiness is reality divided by expectations. And you put all these expectations on yourself. So let's rein that back in. And the world isn't so binary, like there's right and wrong and good and bad. And I think a lot of us have been trained since birth to mitigate risk. And I'm like, no, I, it's risky not being risky. So I want to go all in. I'm going to try stuff. I'm going to fail because I celebrate failure. And that is so exhilarating to me, right? I put some stuff up. I'm like, that didn't perform well. What did I learn from that? I'm not ready to give up on it just yet. I'll try some other things. And eventually I'll figure out what works. And to me, this is to just growth and potential and learning and inspiration. I just want to mess up so many times. If you embrace that as part of your goal, it'll be okay. There isn't a right or wrong way. There's just a way. Think about it. If you don't do this, is that the right way? I don't know what, what is right and who gets to judge? Mm -hmm. Certainly not me. But I think when we share that process of what we're going through in the middle of it, 
I think that then that's when you can influence and help somebody else. I've had kids, lots of kids, not lots. I mean, 10 maybe. Mm -hmm. In the years that I've been teaching, come into my office and tell me they were pregnant, right? They're like, oh no. You know what happens? And so I'm like, well, look, this is just a time in your life and you are going to have the... um, you have the ability to help somebody else. Cause I always think about this is, this is the valley part, but you're going to go up the mountain and at the top of the mountain, it may be like, Oh, I'm at the top of the mountain, but it's kind of lonely. Not as many people get to the top and you end up going down and coming back up and right. Mm-hmm. The valley's like this beautiful oasis down in the bottom usually, but we don't really want to be there because sometimes it's very, um, anyway, it can be, there's lots of different analogies with the valley and the mountain. But I think that sometimes when you're going through your desert place, you need to know that somebody's already been there. And that's where you, if you're going through something, then now you will have somebody else to look to that they made it through. Right? Yes. Well, I want to say something about the peaks and the valleys, right? That And Jim Rohn talks about this in seasons and, and there's different seasons in your life and to recognize where you're at in the season and not complain that winter's here. So there's the peak and you go up and then there's a valley and you go down. And when we're at the peak, we're at the top of our game. We feel really happy. And when we're at the valley, we feel really sad and depressed and unmotivated. But if there weren't peaks and valleys, if it was just all peak, that would just be a plane. Flat line. It would be just the middle of the country. It's just flat. There's nothing else. That's it. So we have to embrace that the peaks are the peaks because the valleys exist. And to embrace the ride down like one of the things I do is I hike, right? So going on the way up, I mean, I'm not saying it's the worst thing I do, but it's not super fun. You just do it. But I, I'm just looking forward to get to the top because I get to ride down. It's so fun. You can do a little trail running and it's just so exhilarating that all the potential energy that you built up getting to the top is released in kinetic energy. And I celebrate it all now. It's like, I love going up. I love going down. So enjoy the ride. Mm-hmm. That's it. And share what you're learning. Don't be afraid. You have to put up perfect, um, you know, I think Mario will be able to share about the struggles about being a dad and being at home and trying to have clients and trying to find these things. And there's all these things. There's somebody else that needs to hear what he's going to be struggling in. If we just hold it inside, then it doesn't do good for us. That if we bottle those feelings up, that it manifests in other ways, sickness or whatever. Right. So then we have to share that, but it, it's very hard. Like last week, I made a terrible mistake. I said fighting literacy. Huh, who wants? I didn't want to fight literacy. I wanted to fight for literacy. But mm-hmm. the whole name of the show was fighting literacy. I didn't even catch it. Tony Pinto caught it, and Thomas Jockin, who was my guest, caught it. But my husband, at the end of the night, he's like fighting literacy. What's the, you don't want people to read, Diane? And I'm like, no, no, that's not what I meant. But it was so funny. But I think it's funny. And good, you got to laugh at yourself. So it's about knowing that you're not perfect and that you're on the thing. You're on a, a, you know, you're on a journey. You told me that when I was really struggling and I was like, I don't know. I just keep hitting wall after wall after wall. And I think it was just a voice of wisdom for me uh, from you coming to me that was like, wow, I need to just let myself fail. And you saying you just fail as often as can because then it's about play. I think that's when we start playing, you know? Yes. <laughs> can I say this though? In this idea that there's perfection, perfection doesn't exist. And by seeking perfection, we rob ourselves of discoveries of <laughs> the, uh, the happy accidents, the wabi-sabi, if you will. So in writing, fighting literacy, you actually fought, a thought, a cliche. And you get more people to pay attention to fighting literacy than if you just said fight illiteracy. Yeah, we get it. I know. We're, 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 everybody fight illiteracy. But by doing that intentionally or, or on accident, it's actually something that's more thought provoking to say like, maybe we do need to think about what literacy means and how many people can actually read this. Have you ever seen that burn the books um, YouTube do you know what I'm talking about? Oh my gosh, I got to send you guys this. I'll okay. put it in the show notes. But anyway, this they did an ad campaign and they were all, you know, people put these little signs that vote for whoever. Well, there was this in this small little town in Michigan, I think. And they, it was like vote. Um, so they said, we're having a book burning party. It was like the day after the vote happened where the library would close. And really they were like, 
a <laughs> book burning party. There'll be bags, get babysitters, all kind of thing. And then people would put on Facebook, like, you are crazy book burning, you know, and like they totally just spun it and they voted. People came out to vote and they voted yes for the library and no to burning books, but it was a marketing team twisted it. And yes. I, yes, it could have been, I, but I didn't do it on purpose. But I also think it's important to know, to tell people that you mess up. Um, Chris, thank you so much for doing this with me today. It's been my absolute pleasure. Glad to do it. And you know, when we were at Creative South, I didn't get one picture. I do have a standing behind, like, uh, the photographer took a picture and we're standing in line next to each other, but that's it. Next time we're together, we're going to, I'm going to make you do a selfie with me. I would love to. And you were too busy attending to people. That's why you didn't think about our I, moment. I know. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. And next week we have one of our own Taylor Ackerman. She is amazing. I can't wait to feature her. She is in here probably. Maybe if I scroll down, I can see her. Um, and she's going to take us through her sketchbook. She works at a university, but she has this other dream and she is an amazing illustrator. So it's kind of, she has a day job, but then she has this other passion project that she's really pursuing. I can't wait for you guys. You've seen her in the chat. Now you'll see her in person. Well, not in person, but in video. Anyway. That's it. Oh, wait, I have to tell how people could follow you just in case. Okay. So you don't know uh, right now, you don't know where people could get the book, but if they were going to try, you will probably be posting this on Instagram and they can get on a mailing list, right? Yes, you can. You can sign up for our mailing list. Go to thefuture.com. The future spelled with an E, drop the E, go. That's how you remember it thefuture.com. And you can also find us on YouTube and social media. The future is here. It's not somewhere else. It's here. And thank you. Yeah. So, and just the, you can also the Chris Doe right. at Instagram and yeah, uh, at the Chris Doe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the, yeah. Anyway, well, and we'll see you guys next week. You can always hit like and subscribe and share this with somebody. Hopefully, maybe it helped them maybe understand that they can, maybe they're, they can share what they're learning and that's good enough. <laughs> That was super smooth. <laughs> that was terrible. But I always do a terrible ending. Well, let's say this. Uh, it's a work in progress and I'll, I'll end it for you. Hey guys, if you enjoy this piece of content, you want to make sure you don't miss future episodes with amazing guests that have really profound philosophical things to say by your very generous host, Diane. Make sure you click that bell notification. Some, I don't know where it is. Click on that so that you don't miss a single episode. Till next time, see you guys. That was awesome. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash design recharge. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. They have more than just nonfiction books, people. So if you want to hear some awesome stories, they have fiction books too. I do read them sometimes. You can always support the channel by doing the Patreon and the Patreon challenge will start September 1st. You will get access, if you're a patron, you'll get access to the two different challenges. You can choose which challenge you want to do. Um, they're both design challenges, but they're different. And I love Elementor. People, if you're going to buy, there's a free version. And then get the free version through this link, bit.ly, bit.ly slash capital D, capital R, and then Elementor. And then when you're ready to buy, go back and get use that same link and get it. Because I'm telling you, this thing will change your the way you design. It's so much easier. And talk about a visual builder that works. And there are some, um, they're free themes that work super well. Anyway, Timely. I told you about Timely. Did I tell you how to get Timely? Bitly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash Timely. You can try it for 14 days. Did I tell you that? Oh, and this link, Bitly bit.ly slash dr timely gives you a 10% discount once you activate your subscription. That's pretty good. Oh, and the Patreon, because I forgot to tell you where that one was. That's patreon.com slash Diane Gibbs. The end. You can find all these show notes at rechargingyou.com slash 311. Isn't that a band? And that's a band that Scott Soder likes. I should have done that on March 11th. Oh, well, here we go. Have a great, oh, hit, 
hit subscribe and like if you're watching this on YouTube and give us a comment if you're on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. I'd love to know what you think. You don't, it won't hurt my feelings if you give me something negative. I'm okay with that.